when you you asked for the meeting, would you like me to just go back through the presentation? Do you have specific questions that you want to ask? I had specific questions. I mean, I was not planning on it being an hour long meeting, right. Mister. I really wasn't. When we talk about peaking units, mm -hmm. in my mind, those are the CTs, and whether they're um, the CTs we've got and we operate them until they die, or we replace them with reciprocating combustion turbines, or we replace them with the third item you mentioned, the other turbine. Okay, to me, they're short-term solutions. They're not long-term. It will be here in 40 years, like Mr. Hobart is concerned about. And I too, I'm, I'm looking at, you know, long after I'm dead, have we prepared for the future? I don't want to right. do something that's just going to work for five or 10 years. So, peaking units, is that a long term solution or not? CTs, are they the only peaking units? I guess no, that's my and, first but they can be. They can be. Let me, um, over the course of the day, or over the course of over the course of, of weeks or whatever, power our power demand you know goes up and down, and what they kind of the average that this is what we refer to as our base load. Is that only met by a power plant? Power plant or purchase power or whatever, uh, and, and I'll, okay. I'll I'll get okay. that. So your base load. Your base load is this kind of your average, how much power you need day in and day out. Then, because of a hot day, a real cold day with electric heat, um, other issues, there's going to be these spikes. Additional generation has to be brought on, or what's running has to be ramped up in order to cover these peaks. Right. Units that are typically in standby waiting for this are what we refer to as peaking units. So a, a power plant, a coal plant, a dogwood, um, a large a large gas turbine of some kind, though wind farms, a lot of those are referred to as base load because they're running, they're running somewhat continuously supplying this normal load and then something else has to be brought on to cover the peak. So that's why we refer to them as peaking units. Your whether it's a reciprocating engine, uh, Wardzilla made is the brand name that, that you may have heard uh, Councilman Huff refer to. Uh, Wardzilla, those are reciprocating engines, diesel engines, you can run them on gas. Small combustion turbines like we currently have, those typically do not run continuously. Because they are incapable of running continuously? They're, ca they're capable, but you'll shorten their life shape. Okay, all right. So um, they're designed to they're designed to be run on demand. Okay. You can start them up, you can shut them down. The thing is that it doesn't it doesn't hurt them to start up and shut down repeatedly. So um, is the only way we're going to meet a base load requirement with the power plant? No. Okay. And the reason for that. Think of Southwest Power Pool as a big tank. Everybody is dumping power in, including us, and then we all have a spigot that we get to draw off of. All the power that we generate, whether it's our CTs, whether it's the wind farms in Kansas, whether it's IATAN, Dogwood, all the power goes in the bucket. Everything that we, every bit of energy we use to serve our customers comes out of the state. We, we don't actually, so even if we buy, even if we were to build a big power plant, this is still where we're serving our customers from. The power plant would just be how much we're contributing to the overall supply. So why would I want to build a power plant versus buying more of another item? That's where the reliability piece comes in. Okay. Here's 
Can I back up one second on that? Yes, Jim. Your previous illustration, um, everybody's Southwest, we have agreements as all the electric utilities do with Southwest Power. So they, I mean, we rarely get called on now by the Southwest Power Pool when somebody else needs power. So if we had the ability to contribute more mm -hmm. into that tank, we still only get to turn on the spigot for what we want to take those withdrawals. But if we were able to contribute more into that tank, people are purchasing power from us. Yes. So that, I mean, that would be. Well, Southwest Power Pool. Would right. Sir, power. Southwest Power Pool would call on us more frequently when somebody else in the pool is has a demand that they can't meet. Right now, we're not getting, or, you know, over the last several, many years, we are high up on that list. So, because our power is you know, expensive, what you know, or or not as ready right. or all that. I mean, we've heard that, you know, for several years on this council is that we're not necessarily in a good position when we're called upon to deliver that power. So a reason to be more in the generation business that contributes to that tank. I mean, there's a, you know, there's there, it's revenue. Right. I mean, it could potentially be some revenue. I mean, how much revenue compared to the cost is the question, but it is um, an opportunity to be in the marketplace to be selling power if you look outside at our, of our customers. Yes, the, the customers, I mean, the resources we have right now, um, IATAN and now this is just energy. This doesn't, this doesn't include operating costs and all that, but just the energy. IATAN and Nebraska City, um, they're about $16 per megawatt hour. Then you go to um, Marshall Wind Farm is 34. I think I, I, think I, I think I got these numbers right. Um, Smoky Hills is 42. Then you go up to you drop down to uh, now it's it's not part of SPP, so it doesn't really come into play, but. Our solar farm is 81.50 a megawatt hour. So, looking across the region, SPP says who's available and how much do they cost, and they will schedule the cheapest one they get their hands on. Yeah. Now, because of the tax incentives and the other issues, uh, federal issues with with uh, some of the constraints they put on wind power, if the wind's blowing. Those get brought in. Even if it drives the price down, those get brought in. So to supplement the wind, they have to look for what else is available, who can start up, uh, and what's the cost. Our units, because they're old, and I and J, because they run on fuel oil, um, they're, let's say, $100 a megawatt hour. So as long as there's somebody else that can start up and meet the demand, they're going to get called before we will. We buy, if we were to buy a new, more efficient unit, the likelihood of us getting called goes up. Uh, our energy partner, Tanaska, did an analysis based on the real conditions of the last three years. They went back and looked at what all the set points were and put in the numbers that the GE gave us for this uh, potential turbine that they've offered instead of h being run less than six percent of the time this unit could possibly have run as much as 30 percent under those same conditions so uh, just updating the technology up getting the, the better efficiency puts us in a better position to run and every time we every every bit of energy that we produce as the mayor pointed out goes into that bucket and we get paid for it so it's an offset to our or additional revenue coming in as opposed to just drawing off and paying for energy. Jim. 
to put this in the in as simplest terms possible. Southwest Power Pool has contracts all over the country or in our region, in yeah, region, region. geographic region, and they buy power and sell power. That's what they do, right? You might you might consider them a broker. They're a broker. So they made the deal. Now they're the middleman. So their job, in order for them to make the most money, they have to they have to make the biggest margin, right? Which means they have to buy it for as cheap as they can and sell it for as much as they can. Is that right? They're I know I'm simplifying it. Yes, you're correct. Now in the, in between that mix though is they have a contractual obligation to fulfill the needs of their customer. Mm -hmm. Right. So they don't always maximize their profit on every of these transactions that happen, right? As members, as members of that co-op alliance, however you want to describe it, as yeah. members of that pool, we get the low price. Right. If we were before okay. 2014, before 2014, we were on our own. Right. We, we had somebody who sat down in the outside the control room and literally marketed power, sometimes in power engines, looking for the best price he could find. And you you are a you're subject to the market. Uh, whatever you can, right. if you don't have a long term contract right. and you're trying to market your own power, you're selling what you can if you can find somebody to pay your price, and you are you you can only buy it at the prices that are being offered. As a member of the pool, we take advantage of those collectively low prices, and, and it's, it's been a big benefit. Now, so I know you've got a bunch more I'm trying to get this. So the, the, the biggest issue, one, one of the biggest issues for us is if we, the, the, the more money we spend, the bigger thing we build, that's a bigger investment in our business of power brokering. Correct. Part. In other words, to be interesting, to be able to sell power to the Southwest Power Pool, which they could sell it to any, which then provides it to anybody else in the contract. We have to provide it one on demand or as much on demand as possible, and two, cheaper. We are literally competing with all of the other power producers in the Southwest Power Pool. Correct. Okay. Now, power plants that use a boiler, that use steam turbines, they have a hard time doing that because, like for example, the Blue Valley plant uh, and a, a 50 megawatt, a 50 megawatt boiler is a small boiler. We had 12 hours from the time they called us and said we want you on. We had 12 hours burning fuel to get up to the temperature we needed to produce steam. That 12 hours of fuel is a loss. There's no megawatts being generated. There's nothing being sold. And every time, depending on the circumstances, if, if you're running and they say, okay, we don't need you for a day, but 24 hours from now, we want you back on, you have to make a choice. Are we going to maintain temperature or are we gonna shut down? And burn that fuel again. So I mean, either way you go, you either you're either going to sell at a, you're going to take the loss on, on what you're producing when they don't need you, or you're going to spend that fuel to heat back up. So that's why that's why the big plants have a hard time with the with the wind model that that we has been forced on us. Now the reliability piece. Yeah. Here's independence. We've got power coming in from Iatan, Nebraska City. We have power coming in from the wind farms. We have power coming in from dogwood. Within our region, I mean, you also got you got Callaway nuclear plant out to the east. You got uh, Wolf Creek out here. Any of those paths could get disrupted, and then the question becomes, what happens if? And think of these as pipelines. You can only push so much power through that line. Um, water lines, you try to put too much through, they burst. Power lines, they overheat. So Southwest Power Pool can only shove so much power into our region through this line. If this line gets disrupted for some reason, everything else has to pick up the load. 
The question is, can they? Um, that's why Southwest Power Pool does all these studies every year, looking at all these different scenarios. And if we say, if we say <laughs> we want to bring 100 more megawatts from Oneta, Southwest Power Pool has to analyze these conduits and say, can it do it? And if it doesn't, that's where you get these these uh, uh, brownouts. Brownouts, or they say. In order for us to approve this, you're going to have to help pay for transmission upgrades. And that's Oneta's capacity. Um, Oneta's capacity. But the same thing would apply so to a power purchase agreement. Isn't the Oneta, I mean, this has always been a little interesting on the, what we are able to deliver on paper and what we are actually able to deliver it when we need it. I mean, okay. it's, there's a little bit of in my, you know, a little bit of a difference there. I mean, we said for years when when Blue Valley was up and running and when Missouri City was there, I mean, we don't you know whether we ever used it or not, but we could say, well, we could produce it if we absolutely had to. Right. And same, I mean, and that's why we we bought Oneta, but it's really an insurance policy. It is. It I is. mean, it's not really on demand power. But you still have to prove that there's the capability of transporting that power in. Right. Uh, that's so we're not paying for it, right. but we have to prove that it's possible. Right. Um, but there's no way to get it from there to here without us paying for it. We, we, would, we would have to pay, in addition to the capacity charge that we pay now, we would have to pay transmission charges. Right. Uh, we pay for using all these lines, and they pay for us, because Kansas City Power and Light does wheel power through our system. We're totally surrounded by Evergy, and they do, they have power that does flow through our system. We get paid for that. Um, same thing with this. The transmission costs are talking. so in the event of an emergency and there's a disruption in the Southwest Power Pool's ability to deliver energy, we would theoretically then have to pay a tra an extra tra transmission fee to get the, get the energy we need. Any energy that we import, any energy we import, we have to pay transmission charges for. Okay. So that's all that's added. That's figured up into the cost. Okay. Um, and there's a big settlement that's done every day, week, month with SDP. Yeah. Yeah. But the worst case is if everything drops, if we had a blackout. Um, NERC's rules require that you have to have all these contingency plans in place and and we go through and we do exercises and we do drills to, to see how we would respond. In our case, right now, we have those six combustion turbines that we can fire up. We can supply 96, I think 94 megawatts of power. Um, we would be our own little island waiting for energy to get around to reconnecting to us. Having the CTs gives us that that edge. How much power does independent need to day. run on a, on just it's just you know a day in May? Day in day out, 140, 150. Okay. Um, okay. And then it spikes up in the summer. Okay. Um, we would we've got lists. Our operators have lists of what we call critical loads. So we're gonna we're gonna make sure we. We're going to make sure we selectively energize parts of the city to serve those critical loads first, and then we'll add things as we as we can. So, you know, as as this connection gets restored, we'd be able to add some more. As this connection gets restored, we'd be able to pick up some more. But we would have we would have some minimum that we could supply. If we had nothing, then we're just this black hole in the middle of energy, and uh, something tells me we are not going to be high on their priority list for making decisions of what sections to, to put back online. They're going to serve their customers. Um, but aren't they a member of the Southwest Power Pool? They are. 
Okay, so are we dealing with Evergy or are we dealing with the Southwest Power Pool? Within this, well, within the Southwest Power Pool, they have down at Little Rock, they have their their master control room down at Little Rock that, that monitors our entire region. Okay. And every transmission operator, which we are, we're a transmission operator. Evergy's a transmission operator. Right. All of us have to work with the uh, the main control room to start putting the pieces back together. Okay. But in a large in large part, everyone's taking care of themselves while the dust settles. We figure out what happened. Where's the where is the what tripped all this off? How do we fix it? So everyone is kind of building their own piece back together, and then we start connecting the blocks. It for your help, Karen. I, I think what you're saying is. In this event, that's a hardware failure. Software, hardware, I mean. Just, a, it, but it's a break in the system. The somewhere system. outside of us. Something has overloaded the system. A plant, a major plant has tripped off and it caused some other things to trip. Um, it's kind of a, dom usually it's a domino effect. Something bad happened and it caused some more things, which caused some more things, and then you cascade into regional blackout. So while we're talking about that, have we had any issues happen like that while we've been in the Southwest Power Pool? Last year, the last year, Southwest Power Pool declared what they call um, conservative operations 19 times. That means the system is stressed. Our analysis shows there are some potential hot spots. And so we want everybody on deck ready just in case. So 19 times last year alone, they declared conservative operations. Did that, next question then, have we not had power because of one of these sort of failures? Or no, breaks? no we, we've not had to face that um, in as long as I've been here. How long have you been here? 2004. <laughs> okay, 16, it's almost 16, 17, 17 years. Hey, but full day. But for, so it, also in that time, have we made our own power? When I got Our hired, load? when yeah. I got hired, there was something running at Blue Valley plant almost every single day. And in the summer, usually three to five of our five boilers were running every single day. Coal fired boilers. Coal fired boilers. And any do you have any idea what part of the base load we were producing for ourselves? Um they were the two boilers at and the two boilers at Missouri City were 20 each. We have 100, 100-ish here at Blue Valley. So you were looking at 140, 150 megawatts. So most of our base load we were we were able to provide. And then we had other additional contracts we were pulling in uh, to in order to supply the rest. So we were basically instead of joining up with Southwest Power Pool like we are now with a broker to buy the energy. We just had to make our own deals if we had excess energy to sell or if we, if needed, we needed extra to buy. And, and there were times when, there were times when the marketer found a great deal. So he would get a contract for that and then we would bank ours, um, yeah. re reduce our production because Blue Valley, and even though they're coal fired, they were relatively, Compared to an IATAN or a Nebraska City, they were more expensive to run just because yeah. they were less efficient, older units. Um, but but we did produce a lot of them. Now, shifting in 2014, shifting to, uh, we saved a tremendous amount of money. I don't have the numbers for you, but we saved a tremendous amount of money switching from our own operation to. Those numbers might become important in this discussion. So, do you, the, other, the other thing to remember is we stopped burning coal and converted to natural. I mean, coal was cheap. Coal was cheap. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, oh, no, absolutely. So yeah. it, it just progressively, I mean, I've been here since 2012. I mean, it's it's just progressively, it progressively got more expensive and less, less efficient mm -hmm. to do it, you know, to, do it on our own, which is why the decision was made to join Southwest Power Pool, and because it, we could get at a, I mean, up until 2014 or 15, we had rate increases. 
2012, I mean the, 2012 was the last of a program series. Right. OK, 2012. Correction, 2012 was the last of our series. So we those were, um, you know, those were put into place by, you know, the council at, uh, for five year, 7% right, increases mm -hmm. for five years, which ended in 2012. Um, for a lot of reasons, I mean, some of it was infrastructure, um, distribution, repairs of the plant, I mean, all that kind of stuff. But there's sort of a attachment to our, you know, to our power plant. I don't know, you know, I mean, oh, I understand. you know, but the reality is that it doesn't, I mean, people think that, you know, when they put their light at the house, it's coming out of Blue Valley and it hasn't been for a long time. Decades. Yeah, I understand that. And I, um, it's important to know, you know, I, if you, the core corollary I make in my mind, Jim, is, uh, you know, a mom and pop store. Mm -hmm. that's been run out of business by Walmart. When when you're on your island of independence, which seems like a big deal, but we're very, mm -hmm. I mean, we're nothing compared to the Southwest Power Board. We're nothing. We're, like you said, if Energy had a break somewhere, they'd fix a lot of other places first, reconnecting. When you're a little tiny one-man mom, mom and pop shop fighting for your life in the, in the big wild of the market compared against you know, the Southwest Power Pool, which is very much a Walmart. Um, that's hard. That's tough competition. Am I saying a good corollary? I mean, does that make? No, you're, you're, you're right on. OK, all right. But the one of the things you have to keep in mind, we went to we joined the market in 2014. We didn't make the decision to stop burning coal until 2016. Right. So we made that we joined the market when we were still running Blue Valley and, and Missouri City as much as we could afford to run them. Um, so it, it was a it was an economic decision that made sense for independents to join the market. Boilers have a lot of moving parts and the maintenance is not cheap. Every time you start up and shut down that plant, you put those tubes through a, through a thermal cycle and your tubes are not really, your tubes aren't real thick metal. They're I mean, it's, they're designed that way so you can pass a lot of heat through them quickly. Yeah. But every time you every time you do a thermal cycle, you weaken that tube. And every once in a while, when you start up and the pressure comes up, one of those weak spots gives out, yeah. and you have a, a tube leak. Then you have to shut everything down, go in, weld it all up. Yeah. Uh, eventually, you have to replace entire sets of tubes. It's it's a very boilers are a very high maintenance item. So. One, the opportunity to run is made more difficult because of the wind. And two, forcing it to run in that style of operation is going to stress out your system faster and likely to increase your maintenance costs on those boilers. The peaking units, since, they're, since they don't have this 12-hour heat-up period, since they don't have boiler tubes that you're worried about bursting on you, um, they are designed to take advantage of those those cycles. Um, the graph that the graph that was in there that showed the wind power um, that's that's a very now here in the past week there was a lull where for several days there was very little wind. But typically, the wind comes up in the evening, blows through the night. In the morning hours, it starts dropping off. And then in the afternoon, it bottoms out and starts coming up again, day in and day out. So there's always this, there's this valley that has to be covered where the wind stops blowing. The boilers, it's, it's difficult for them to operate in that fashion. Fast response units, whether it's, whether you're talking about reciprocating engines, combustion turbines, they can, they're designed to do that. Start them up. They come up to speed five to 10 minutes, they're online, and you run them for two hours, four hours, six hours, shut them back off. Does the Southwest Power Pool decide if we run H or I or J, or do they just say, independence, you need to produce eight megawatts? We actually, we actually put into, 
we offer into the market specific units and they say we want this one. So are we paid different amounts of money per unit? Yes, because okay. we have different costs. Okay. We we put the we offer it into the market based on our cost to run that unit. Okay. Since H can run on gas, it's cheaper than I or J, which run on fuel oil. Right. So we and typically you'll see um I think across July, so June, July, and August, H ran one or two, one or both of the H units ran something like 80% of the days. Now it may have only been two hours or six hours, but H got called on almost every single day of June, July, and August. The mm -hmm. I and J units, you know, a few days here, a few days there. Yeah. Excuse me. Yeah. We've been talking about um, our six combustion turbines and they produce 12 megawatts or whatever they do, okay? In, in whatever we're going to proceed with, the study, mm -hmm. are we going to look at each individual unit to see what the useful life of that unit is and the cost to run that unit and how much it would cost to maintain the unit until we get to a certain point? Or are we going to look at it just as a package that these six units, combustion units, are a package and we're going to retire them on a particular date? So we've already done that. Yes, yes it's, it's sort of a combination of, of both. I mean, we know that those six combustion turbines are old. Right? Yeah, but I heard six, three to eight years. I didn't know we selected a particular date. The analysis, the analysis that was done in 2019 said, or 2018, which was presented in 19, said five to ten years right. of minimal maintenance costs. Um, beyond, they'll run if we want to put the money into them. They'll run longer. But it's going to cost you. Right. Um, the the turbine inspection, generator inspection, that's like another million a pop. Um, so we did one. We authorized a turbine inspection. 2018. Five and six both had theirs done um, within the last five years. Right. It wasn't all that long ago. Right. I mean, it was when this was starting to be a discussion about and. Yeah. We did that, which was about a million dollars. Um, and that was kind of you know, the moment where we said, OK, we're going to do this one because we have to have it. Right. But we can't afford to continue to do these million dollar <laughs> inspections, which doesn't even you know, touch the repair. I mean, that's just um, so I mean, in reality, we can claim on paper to the I mean our initiation fee to get into the Southwest power pool is to say we can we have the equipment the uh, personnel the people the assets to be able to to meet the criteria to be in the power pool but we're, we've run, what, three of the six combustion turbines on a regular basis. Uh, two of the six. Two of the six. So if we gave all the power off of those two and they came back for more, we really can't fulfill it. We, we, do, get, we do get scheduled. Or it would be, we'd have our fingers crossed. It, it, <laughs> yeah. has, to be, it has to be a day where Wolf Creek is down for right. maintenance. Right. I mean, uh, it would have to be others, extraordinary yeah. circumstances. But we do get called on for yeah. I and J occasion. There, there have been there have been days in July and August where we had all six turbines running. So it does happen. So I mean, last time we spent a million bucks to inspect one of these was kind of we said we're going to do this because we really have to, but we can't. You know, this isn't this isn't a good plan. And Southwest Power Pool, your capacity is 112. Your capacity requirement obligation is 112 percent of your max load, um, and that it's our historic is 315, but currently it's down around uh, like 270 something. Um, so it's evaluated every year. But when we made the Oneta contract, we did not replace Blue Valley. 
we only replaced the minimum we needed to to meet that 112 percent mm -hmm. so southwest powerful doesn't care how you meet that obligation so these 94 megawatts that we get credited for from the six combustion turbines if we decide to retire them southwest powerful doesn't care how we replace that capacity as long as we replace the capacity so whether it's additional contracts with Oneta, if whether it's uh, more mm -hmm. purchase power contracts like we have with uh, ITAN in Nebraska City, um, additional ownership in Dogwood, additional plants of our own, it's all the same to, cap to the Southwest Power Pool. Um, however, they have to analyze it, review it, make sure that it's going to meet the needs of the region, that it's going to fit within the, that reliability picture. Let me ask you something. Because you brought up dogwood, and I got to step out for a minute to do a thing here shortly. Um, you said in your presentation, dogwood runs on average 30% of the time. 40. 40% last, 40, 40 la last year? 2020, they ran 40%. Okay, and that's a 100 megawatt natural gas plant? No, it's 600. Oh, my apologies. I'm glad you corrected me. It's a 600 megawatt natural gas plant two combustion turbines and then the waste heat goes to a steam generator so so it that which boosts the efficiency tremendously but uh, a lot more technical detail but it's no, it's a what they call a combined cycle so it's got two gas turbines the waste heat drives a steam generator all three of those contribute to driving generators 600 plus megawatts and they only ran 40 percent of the time okay so obviously 600 megawatts would, I mean, that you just said our peak was 315 in our history. So they're making a lot of power. Why are they only running 40% of the time? Economics. So in other words, 60% of the time, it's cheaper for the, the people that get power that, that dogwood would supply. It's cheaper for people to buy it from somewhere else than it is to have dogwood running and making the power. Correct. Right. If we, I'm not putting this on the table, but there are council members that want it. There are people in the town that would want it. But if we built a dogwood, what if we built our own dogwood? There is not a universe in which, I mean, it would run the same as dogwood, right? Possibly. Yeah. I mean, maybe. So it's not as if we, if we build a power plant, it's going to run all the time and just do all our power. It's not. Is that right? Right. There's going to be, there will be days that it is cheaper for us to buy the power than to make it ourselves. Guaranteed. And we're definitely in that spot right now because we had coal plants and they were old units. And now we have aging or near end of life power generation. Correct. Okay, good. Now, your, your reciprocating engine technology Again, there it's like a big diesel engine, except it runs on natural. It, actually, it's flexible. You can you can set it up for a lot of different things. But we could run it on natural gas. It'd be like having a diesel engine driving a generator. The new systems are very efficient. Um, the combustion turbine that we were talking to GE or the GE has been talking to us about is uh, called aero derivative, which is like jet engine technology, and those are very efficient. Um, Tanaska. Market does our power marketing for us. Tanaska looked at the real conditions over the past three years and said, okay, here's here's what the real market was. And for independence, when you know we, the H units got called on six percent of the time, using the same exact market conditions and the efficiencies and the startup times and the ramp time, the the ramp times that this machine's quoted with, their estimate was it could have been running 30% of the time. So we're talking about five, five, six times the amount of revenue potential compared to the H units. And even, even if you're not selling it, if you're still making it cheaper than you can buy it, I mean, that's efficiency. Now, as far as what that does to the lifespan, just like your car, these these generators and, and turbines 
uh, a lot of their maintenance targets are based on hours of operation. So the more the more hours the more hours you run it, the faster you're going to get to that run that next maintenance period. Um, but uh, at estimated 37 million for a 50 million dollar for 50 megawatts worth of power, that's a bargain. Let's assume Independence makes 400 megawatts, and we only need 300 megawatts. Of that 400, do we directly use 300 and sell the 100, or do we sell all 400 and then get it back? We sell all 400 and get it okay, back. Got it. Okay. Whatever they schedule us to run, we give to Southwest Power Pool. And then we buy it back. And we buy it back. At the cheapest rate that SPV can coordinator. How much do we sell it for? Who sets that price? And that is, is that negotiation. So it is some negotiation, but every every producer, every producer offers into the market okay. their unit at what they think they okay. need to cover their cost. Okay. Uh, give, us an, give us an example there. Do we say there's 10 megawatts for sale on the 20th of August, uh, January? And we'll sell for ten dollars. We would say, like for the for the H units, let's say our our fuel costs. Let's say our our operating cost for H is um, just our amount our fuel costs and, and personnel costs. Let's say that our our cost is um, fifty dollars a megawatt hour. We might looking at the market. We might say SPP, we're we will sell this power to you for fifty five. And if fifty five meets their need, they'll call us and say start up. Sometimes they'll do it a day in advance where they've analyzed the need and they're saying, we know we're going to need you tomorrow. Be ready to go at 4 a.m. It's a cloudy day or the wind or whatever other factors they've, they've done their magic. And they all, but they also have on demand scheduling. I mean, they've got just like we used to have the guy that sat there in the room and looked at all the power and figured out what's the best deal at this time. SPP has people doing that on a real time basis. And they may say, we've had cases where they, at 10 o'clock, they say, we need you on at 11. And we'll send guys out and we'll fire it up. So it, and it's all based on what you offer as a producer. You offer it in right. and they call you and say, OK, okay. we need you. Okay. What's firing it up look like? Um, I mean, how, what, what, describe that to us. If we know. If we've got time to get them there, we will send an operator out to the site just to do a quick visual, make sure everything's ready. We can actually start them from the control room. Push a button, start it up. That starts a gas compressor. The gas compressor fires up some other pieces, and then that gets fuel into the turbine, and the turbine starts. Okay. The operator on site would be there to watch the Watch the gauges, make sure the pressure's coming up correctly, that there's no alarms, pop it up. Um, if you have to start it up and you don't have someone there, then we try to get someone there as soon as we can, just so they can look at those, the, all those temperatures and pressures and make sure that everything's operating the way it's supposed to. So when they're, so do we have staff for each one of the six, or is there staff that any one of the six they can go out and right now our we we have elaine elaine came up with a schedule that it's not 24 7 right but it pretty well spreads our we've got we right now we have four plant operators okay and they are scheduled at staggered intervals between i think i think the latest trial we've done is like monday through saturday okay and maybe 6 a.m to 6 p.m. and they're they're staggered over that period that um, we cover that. The nice thing is like the two units at age sit side by side. Yeah. So if five and six both get called on, one operator can go out there and right. monitor both units. Um, if one of the I or J units, if we've got it, if we've got two operators available, we'll send somebody out for the other one. Otherwise, we've got somebody in a truck that's running. So on the days when we're not using any. Mm -hmm. What I mean, what are the what's happening with those plants? We those use those. We use those personnel then for whatever whatever plant maintenance needs that we have. 
uh, they can assist the our plant mechanics. Okay. Um, you know, they can do some of the facility maintenance. But work. when we're called on, yeah. we need them. But they're there when we need them. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And just because I th we we get a lot of questions about that part yeah. of the operation, the agreement that we struck with IBW this last bargaining session. There was a provision in there before that said we could never lay anybody off. There, and so part of the negotiation uh, was to remove that provision from the agreement that enabled us to proceed with the closure of Blue Valley. OK, but an additional step there was that uh, when it comes to CT operations, there's a period of cross training, which the union that, that was a big step for the union. So I want to give them credit there to cross train people. And so an operator can do um, mechanic work, right? And so at some point in time in the future, depending on how this operation goes, CT operation goes, there the agreement contemplates further staff reductions once we have our, our hands around how this operation needs to work. So this, this was kind of an interim step leading to whatever we do next. So it's absolutely contemplated there. We, we're not looking to let people go just to let people go, but as the operation dictates and our needs change, that that is we're, we have the ability to do that. Okay, and we we plan for that and negotiated in this agreement in a very deliberate way. That flexibility. And we're very transparent and upfront with the union about that. Yeah, under our old model of operation, the operators were trained specifically to operate the equipment. The mechanics were specifically trained just to do maintenance. There was no no cross pollination at all. Period. Everybody was siloed in their specific task. Okay. So when it came time to, well, we don't need this many of that or this many of that. The problem was nobody's trained to do each other's jobs. So we're in the process of trying to work through that now to where we have. Uh, and um, I, I I asked Elaine about this back when we were doing the discussions because um, I came out of the steel industry previously in a previous life. New core steel, one of the ways new core steel has been profitable is because they have their people are not operators or mechanics or technicians. They're whatever they get qualified. So you have one person that might be able to fill three roles. Uh, it's been very successful for them. So we're giving that a try with this up but there is there's some significant training involved to get them out of the narrow window that they had before to be able to encompass the whole operation mm -hmm. so back to karen's question about i mean we've done at least a preliminary assessment of we know which units are the oldest the most inoperable requiring you know expensive maintenance. I mean, we've done that, um, at least preliminary sort of evaluation. But if one unit, I mean, we decommissioned one unit, we got to replace that capacity. I mean, we got to replace At a minimum, capacity. we have to replace the capacity. At the minimum, we have to replace the capacity. So, um, I mean, considering the whole batch is on a five year, you know, five to eight year. It doesn't seem to make a lot of sense to kick them off one by one. I mean, we, I mean, we might phase that, but we have to have a plan right. to re replace all of it. Well, and to address that, if, if you wanted to spread out your capital costs, right? J is the, the two J units are probably the least reliable right now. I would argue that the I, the two units that I are the most important from a reliability aspect because they they support the whole south end of our operation in the event of a contingency. Um, the H, they're the ones that run the most, so they're the ones we we actually get some revenue from. Um, if you wanted to spread out your capital costs, you could target and say, okay, we're going to put because we've got because we've got an opportunity, we're going to take we're going to put 50 megawatt turbine. At blue at the blue valley line, we know we have the electrical infrastructure. We used to have 150 megawatts right. right there, and the distribution 
site is, is sitting there. Right there. Yeah. So we could put a we could put a unit there. And then we could look at maybe a couple of those recip. Those are up to 18, so they would almost be a direct replacement of the two units at J, just a different technology. But you could put at either I or J a couple of units there. Um, you could you could retire what you needed to to match what you installed. So you could you could spread this out mm -hmm. so that you're not trying to bite it all off in one chunk. And yeah. then when we take them offline. When we just say this one's done, <laughs> now we can't. Um, what happens? I mean, I, I presume it's a worthless piece of equipment at that point, but then we have, I mean, there's got to be some expense in disposing of it, of the components, correct? There would be, there would, I'm sure there would be some, some yeah. demolition costs there. Now, one option that you could have, depending on where you located things, if we put, Let's say we decided to get two of these 50 megawatt turbines and put them both at, at Blue Valley. We could stop operating the units at I and J, but leave them sitting there as available capacity. Mm -hmm. um, there's a potential, and I, and I don't want to. I, my crystal ball is cloudy. I don't know how how much, but there's a possibility. They could run 10 more years. Or even if they don't run, if, if we, we don't if use we, them all that if much, if we keep them in, if we keep them in standby, that we might be able to market capacity ourselves. Mm -hmm. So there and is it sounds much powerful. Or to somebody else around us that oh, okay. comes up, just like. So we're not locked in that we can only deal with the Southwest Powerful. Well, just like we went to Oneta, Southwest Powerful didn't broker that deal for us. We went to Oneta and okay. bought capacity, okay. and bought capacity from them. And made it part of our deal. Yes, just helpful. Got it. So the other thing that I want to address is nothing in our modern world has a 50 year horizon. Nothing. I mean, technology is just moving at such a rapid pace that that just, um, you know, we've had this whole, you know, coal and natural gas plant for you know however many years it's been decades 1958 it's 58 okay 62 years my friend yeah so 62 years <laughs> no, no, nothing i mean i hear what some of the council members have expressed is you know we don't want a you know uh short term we don't want to spend a bunch of money and then have the the um, you know, having to spend a whole bunch more money in 10 years because that technology is outdated. Nothing's, I mean, I think you said the other night, all of these lifespans projections are based on a 15 to 20 year horizon. I mean, nothing we do has a shelf life of 50 years. The furthest thing I saw projected out for energy needs, energy supplies, went out to 2050. So they're looking at the next 30 years. Yeah. Uh, that's about, there. I don't see any projections going any further now than that. Just too many. I years. mean, the leaps and bounds we've taken from 2014 to 2021. Tremendous. Are astounding. I mean, from, you know, join the Southwest Power Pool, stop the coal, you know, go, go to the natural gas. I mean, we've made more rapid progress in the last seven years than we had in the previous 60 or 55. And how we provide power to our community. My, my personal opinion, the days of building a big fossil fuel plant of any kind, that ship was sailed. Um, we're off, certainly we're not And too bad because we it. had that opportunity once upon a time. And you know, for and for a lot of reasons we didn't do it, but that we, we could have had IATM. When I got hired <laughs> we didn't. when yeah. I got hired in two thousand four, that was the master plan for yeah. the new coal plant. Uh, and it became well, that's not gonna happen, let's build a dogwood type facility. And then that didn't happen. But 
the opportunity here in this region for another big plant, I think, is limited. And we see that in the operation of dogwood. Um, Iatan and Nebraska City, because they are latest generation coal plants, ultra efficient, cheap fuel, they're running, they're targeting 80 to 85 percent, and they're starting to have trouble getting that number. So their run time is starting to come down, although it's significantly better than dogwoods. But where I see in this region, where I see the opportunity to meet Southwest Power Pool's needs is with something that can respond quickly, start up two times a day if you needed to, mm -hmm. shut it down, start it back up 12 hours later. That's that's where the opportunity is to fill those gaps in the. So in that the sounds like the reciprocating engines. I mean, or what you or combustion turbine either one. Yeah. An aero derivative combustion turbine or the re recip engines, both of those would fit that profile. Okay. And the, the real question just really comes down to how do we want to get there? Do we want to do we want to look at 100 megawatts now to replace all night all the combustion turbines? Do we want to do one piece now and a second piece later? Um, both technologies, we will get you all at the council. We will get you the best information we can uh, to help you make that decision. But we need to we need to start going out for request for proposals so that we can get you that information. Um, the lead times, that's the, the Southwest Power Pool right now is the choke point. Um, as a member of Southwest Power Pool, we have to get their concurrence to connect a new system to the grid. If we bought more shares, a bigger share of dogwood, um, how would that positively impact our position as Southwest Power Pool? We would still have to go through the same. We would still have to go through the same analysis of can we import that power to independence? Okay. Uh, and right now, that they are still evaluating requests from 2017. Okay. You mentioned that we can get a, a leg up. How, if, how, what did you say on that? If we if we tell Southwest Power Pool, we're going to replace the two units as subject or spot. Um, it doesn't have to be the same technology, but if we're going to take, let's, I think it's uh, 32 megawatts at sub I. If we tell them we're going to install 32 megawatts of new generation at sub I, here's the, here's the details, that would go into what they call a generation replacement path, which right now they're saying 6 to 12 months. 6 okay. to 12 months. Okay. I, I, I had missed part of what yeah. you said on Monday. We, okay, thought, got we it. thought we could maybe get in with that since we've been less than a year since we shut down Blue Valley, but it has to be a year within a year of shutting down prior to um, in order to qualify for that, that fast okay. track. Okay. They are getting tremendous number of complaints from the membership and SPP is working at how they can change yeah. their system because yeah. let's face it, if it's five years to get an answer, there's no contract out there that's going to give you a bid that's good for five years. Yeah. So you have to have numbers to put into the into your request, but those numbers aren't going to be any good five years down the road. So something has to change, and Southwest Power Pool is working on that. My last question, believe it or not, have we made money selling power to the Southwest Power Pool, or have we pretty much paid our own way? I I think with our with our current assets, uh, we are we have a cost offset. Okay. We're, so we, we have are, to make a profit. Yeah. Is it possible to make a profit? I've heard we should, for example, get a hundred megawatts to generate and we'll sell it for a profit, but but that's not necessarily true. Coffeeville, uh, coffee. I talked to their director. Uh, Monday, uh, Coffeeville put in three or four, I don't remember, three or four of the recip engines. They are covering their debt service. Okay. So, yes, it is possible. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of it depends where. But they, they're just covering their costs. They're not making a profit. Well, they're making enough to. Well, they were offsetting their debt. Right. 
they're offsetting right. the debt. Right. And so at the end of the day, ten years from now, every dollar we paid to Aneta is gone. Uh -huh. Every dollar we paid to Evergy or Mudgy Muck, a Missouri joint, mm -hmm. every dollar we paid them is gone. Okay. Every dollar we invest in independence is right here. That's our asset. We control it. So the 12% of dogwood is our asset we control. It. That is our asset. We, okay. we have a say in it. Let's put okay. it that way. It's okay. also our As a board of directors, we have a seat. <laughs> so yeah. there's, you know, I know. There's risk. You, there's value in mitigating risk. You know, in having someone else, the Oneta contract. There's value in someone else assuming all that risk for us too. Right. I I absolutely support a diverse portfolio. Um, I, putting all our eggs in one basket would make me nervous. Very nervous. Um, so I I like the fact that we've got these. We've got a good contract with Nebraska City and. and so, Jim, I see it a little bit as. I mean, this rotate. I mean, it's like we're having, we're contemplating how we put money or put power into the tank. But Evergy is going to have to be contemplating that down the road, and everybody else is going to have to co contemplate that down the road. So, I mean, this isn't, you know, really linear <laughs> in my mind. It's like, Okay, you know, those de that demand for power is not going to diminish, but people's ability to provide it, everybody's going, you know, in this constant cycle of evaluating that. And so we really need, I mean, I think it's relevant to look at Evergy and they said, you know, we're going to retire, I mean, we're going to run our coal plants for as long as we can, and then they're going to be done. And when that is, hard to, you know, put a date on it. But we have a ability to step into that gap when that happens. <laughs> you know, I mean, we have the ability, in a sense, to say, in anticipation of what other people's um, deficiency are going to be, we can stand at the ready to replace that. Or to have a role in, in replacing that. So it's, you know, sort of this revolving, and in then, my mind, I mean, I'm not saying, I'm not here to say that's what we should do. I'm just thinking, you know, we aren't in a vacuum. I mean, that power is coming from a lot of different sources. And those companies or municipals or co-ops or whomever also are going to be looking at this at some point in time. We just happen to be looking at it now. But we need to have, you know, understand the big picture and where the demand is going to be in the future. And if we have it, that could be good for us. Well, and market price isn't the only driver in that. In that, when SPP is looking for generation, its price isn't the only objective. Because like right now, all the wind projects in general, with all these new wind projects, they're out here somewhere. Well, if if this if this input is carrying as much load as it as it's designed to carry, and South Coast Power Pool needs a hundred more, it doesn't do them any good to even if it's cheaper. It doesn't do them any good to start up another plant out here because they can't get the power through. Right. This can the Kansas City area is what we right. Doing. That's they, why they built a giant. A they're point. building a giant humongous transmission line north of us to get the power from Kansas through Missouri you know, to someplace else. With us being with us being on the eastern edge of Southwest Power Pool, if there's a if there's congestion in the KC area, we have an asset that they can start that they don't have to bring power in through one of these other areas. So that congestion issue is also part of the part of the, sure. that's why the, we we have an opportunity because of where we're located to help meet that peak demand, that niche market where something's happened and we need 30 megawatts right now. Independence fire up. You, I'm just coming back, but you you have identified uh, a whole.
hole in the, a gap in the market that you think we could fill with the at least with the one you're talking about yes, a 50 megawatt 37 million dollar guy is that right that's correct okay just i was out of it for a second yeah okay or um and councilman Huff, he, he hasn't gotten me the information but uh whoever he was talking to about the uh, warpzilla package um we, coffee bill that's what they put in was a chain of warpzillas um there's been several utilities down in texas that put in six to nine of those because you only start as many as you need at the moment. Uh, and they run on what that those reciprocating engines? They have what's the fuel source? We would set it up for natural gas. Okay. Uh, but both the 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 GE turbine and the Warpzillas, uh, they are capable of running on multiple fuels. I mean, you can set them up for diesel fuel. Only don't know why you would. It's too expensive. But you want to run okay. right. But you can also okay. you or can also bios. add hydrogen. Yeah. Hydrogen's mm -hmm. hydrogen's green fuel, um, so you can do a hydrogen natural gas blend. Uh, there's different, there are fuel flexibilities that you can use to okay. run these. Is that the same type of style of the the thirty seven million dollar one? The Warpzillas are what we call re reciprocating engines. It's like a diesel block, mm -hmm. only you're only you're filling the pistons with gas instead oh. of, instead of diesel. Okay, is that the is that the same style of thing we're we're talking about doing or not? Yeah, the well, it it's one of the options. Pardon me. GE's, yeah, he's not GE's trying to lock turbine. in. Not no. trying to lock in. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The GE turbine is an aero derivative combustion turbine. It's kind of like it's kind of like hooking up a jet engine to oh. to a generator shaft. Okay. Your your gas is your gas is spinning the turbine. The turbine spins the generator. Okay. Your recips, your diesel block. Yeah. Your in your your car engine mm -hmm. turns. The shaft and the shaft turns the generator. Those turn on like that. Push the button and they fire up. Yeah. Now the other, ones on the, size, few, the other ones take a few minutes. Um, I think we've got a. I think the GE said it had a five minute a five minute startup. Yeah. Um, so which is that's a, that's man. Good. Essentially, that's that's yeah. instant so, start. Yeah. yeah. I think right now for for Southwest Power Pool to qualify as a fast start unit. It has to be less than ten. Oh, okay. So either one of those would be either one of those would fit. Any, any of those would fit on that. And and we're not. I mean, we're not saying this is the answer. Right. We're saying Let's we've got we've out. got options. Yeah. We've got options we can look at. There's multiple ways to skin this cat. Um, our recommendation is we start moving. Okay. And you're you'll be able to come back and say, here's the big here's the here's what we looked at. Here's all the things. Here's all the megawatts versus start times versus natural gas all that stuff and say i mean obviously the point of this would be you to come back and say this is what i recommend right yeah okay and all i'm asking is before i launch all my folks into this project <laughs> that we have a sense that that's the direction the council wants yeah. to go and so we're clear this is not again i think everybody's made the point vociferously but that this is not a small undertaking. No, sir. No. From 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 the investigation research part to plugging it in is a is a years long thing. Multiple years. Okay. To get well, through all of it. Again, I'm not trying to pick you down. I'm just trying to get an to idea. Get, to get to, to the, the decision, decision. Um, we could probably have a we could probably have an RFP out. Um, Within a few weeks to start getting proposals. Okay. Um, depending on how much time we give them, we can get those proposals back, yeah. and then we can start looking at. Uh, okay. Now, SPP does an annual submission process, and it's it's April. So we could, I mean, we could get something into their, we could get something into their review queue um, by April. Um, it does cost you a little bit. I, it's, I don't know what, I'm not sure what the cost is. It's under $100,000. Uh, it depends on the size of the project. If you, we could get enough data that we could get something into their system to, to be reviewed. Um, currently, currently they, their process does allow you to make some changes along the way. So Even after you submit it in April? If they come back and say, you know this this little piece of it looks like it's a problem and you say well what if we change that okay um okay that may be one of the things that 
they change because okay. we get the big guys are out there throwing 20, 30 projects in, half of them are never ever going to see the light of day. And it's clogging up the system. Just, just in case, though, right? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I think the part of that that's important is also is that this be baked in to a strategic plan that is um, adopted not only by the council, but in a sense endorsed by the community. Because there's going to be an election in 15 months. Then 24 months after that, there's going to be another election. You know, Jim's going to hit the lottery and retire and we'll never see him again. I mean, things will change. I mean, things in our leadership, in our governance, in our will change. But once we may pick the path, it ha it's going to have to, I mean, we're, we're not going to be able to turn back. Right. So the community, as, you know, the school districts, the, the chamber, the economic development corporation um, need to know and, and, and have input into this decision because they're going to have to be the watchdogs of it. I mean, to some degree. I mean, they're going to set, have to hold the city responsible and say, this is the path you chose. We expect you to stick with. I mean, that's, True. you know, a very important component. I mean, yeah. we all inherited decisions from the past, good and bad. I mean, or, you know, ones we like, ones we don't like. But there's still, there has to be a continuity. Other, and that just has to be baked into this decision. But and like I pointed out Monday night, if the decision is we can't afford this, so we're just going to let the combustion turbines go, that's that's one possibility. You're still going to pay $3 million a year to replace that capacity and an estimated potential $37 million in transmission system upgrades to take care of and cover, mm -hmm. that, cover that area. But Jim, if we let the combustion turbines go, we've we have lost nothing. our power license, haven't we? And isn't that a valuable asset for this city? Um, I mean, if we have no generation capability, what happens to our power producing license? Well, again, Southwest Power Pool doesn't care well, where well, we don't get we the energy. Care? I mean, once it's gone, isn't it gone? We'll never get it back. Um, trying to get trying to get permits through the EPA are easier if you have a current one. Um, if you if you if we completely shut down generation and then decide 10 years later that we want to buy something new, it'll be more difficult, a longer process to get through the EPA than if we simply modify an existing permit. And we only have one left, right? I mean, when well, we shut down Missouri City, we lost that power left. Correct. We've got we've got permits. We've got air permits for Blue Valley and air permits for the three substations. Okay. All right. But listen, you're going to pay three million dollars a year for that capacity if you let those turbines go, which they have to go sooner or later. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> they're going to make the decision for us. Right. But, <laughs> but you don't do it. But it's not like that's a zero cost option. Right. It's still going to cost you three. Three million dollars under the current contract, and in twenty right. and in twenty thirty, you have that's up for renegotiation. Will you be able to uh, provide us in your presentation the debt service numbers? I mean, presentation. Your recommendation. Request for oh, financing. I'll work with Brian, and we'll we'll, we'll look that's to see what be, that impact is. That's going to be extremely crucial to this whole process. Oh, yeah. um, as you probably know from just in general, but from the governance point, um, that will be a factor in the decision. So, I think that because you, I mean, you're looking at probably if you want to do it piecemeal, I mean, you're probably looking at probably you know 40 million dollars in the first chunk, right, and another 40 to 50 million dollars in the next chunk, mm -hmm. depending on how you spread that out. So this is not a small decision. I I recognize that. Yeah. 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 We're in a we're in a we're definitely in a transition time, not just from where power comes from or the commoditization with, with organizations like the Southwest Power Pool. Um, we're also in a uh, situation where 
we have built up a surplus at IPL. So we 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 have a much broader picture of you know the mayor talked about it being sort of this all one encompassing sort of vision. It really is in many many ways for us. We absolutely need your help. We got to make sure kidneys numbers are tight so that the folks in the city can understand it, especially so we can understand it and make sure we can afford it and it makes sense, you know, long term. It, you know, we talked about natural gas. Uh, some reports are shorter than others. If we make it to 2050, that's probably a huge win for natural gas. But we all see which way the wind's blowing. Um, that's not me being a green, green tree hugging guy. That's a fact. So. Well, once you know. we, once we have the ability to store with the batteries, that's going to change everything. And that'll yeah. probably be the tipping point for I alternative think, fuels yeah. at some point. Yeah. Uh, but yes, we're not definitely not there yet. I'll show you. This is a EIA, the yeah. Energy Information Agency. They put this out. This shows the growth in generation by type. Yeah, and you've got coal and nuclear all going down. <laughs> Natural gas starts at 37 and ends at 36. So essentially, they're projecting no change for gas. So all the growth yeah. they're showing is in renewables. Mm -hmm. uh, but natural gas, they show holding steady for out to out to 2050. Well, they have some powerful proponents, Jim. People yeah. like Exxon and BP that yeah. uh, <laughs> make cash on that yeah. business. So. And Jim, thank you very much. You know. When you were gone, Dan, uh, Jim mentioned that it's up to 2030 that they're projecting. Uh, 30, 30 because I had said 50 well, years 20, down 50, the road. 20, 20, 50, 50, 50, 50, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, Take care. Yes, yes sorry. Yeah. I didn't know if you heard that. Okay. No, I, I, I paid attention. We said that the other day, and it's, again, based on the, the small amount of research I've done, I, I'm, I'm in agreement with Jim on natural gas for this round for this round uh when it, the council has the discussion on the next round they're not going to be probably talking about natural gas and we we won't be here for it so i was going to say we'll be dead well 30 years 30, years 30 years 30 years <laughs> yes yeah, in yeah. my current yeah. state of health i won't be here for 30 years. <laughs> right. Jim, thank you very much anytime really appreciate this really helped me a lot it, it's a it is a complex thing to get you wrap your hands around and anytime call me and i'll give you whatever help i can thank you so much